Hello and welcome to Cherry Red TV and today I've been joined by Edward Christie Hello. Uh, who, uh, who runs Abstract Sounds That's Records. Correct. Um, welcome to the studio. Um, Edward, could I start by asking you about uh, your pre-music industry background, your, your interest in music and where that came from? Well basically I suppose I, you know, I got very interested in trying to write songs and yeah. um, I spent uh, about two or three years trying to put some stuff together. This is way back before real independent labels existed. Yeah. And it was really hard to get anything into the big publishers or the major record companies. And um, I was in a little garret trying to write these songs and do this. Looking back, they were all complete rubbish and we can understand why they weren't successful. But through doing that, I, uh, I, I, I met a girl and started going out with her. And through that, um, she worked for a major management company. And through that, I got into into the music business uh, proper, as it so. And I, I gave up writing songs and became part of the people behind the scenes. Uh, okay. And that's by sort of how I got into it, really. And, and that was Bell Records, is that right? Well, the, the original people I um, worked with was a company called uh, GTO Managements. And at that time, they were looking after David Bowie, Gary Glitter, the New Seekers, and were having tremendous success. And uh, yeah. I got through because I'd had a qualification of being able to drive a Rolls Royce. And the management company wanted a Rolls Royce and a driver, and uh, so that's how I got into it, really. And uh, obviously, I, I must have shown some uh, ability because they moved me on after about a year to some other things. Spark, so. so that's how. Had that's... Any interesting adventures while you were driving people around in a Rolls Royce? Well, yes. I mean, uh, you know, I was, I, it was you know going to the airport and picking up the Seekers and you know yeah. picking up Gary Glitter. And on a couple of occasions, um, I had to go around to one of the first jobs I did was uh, I had to take some paperwork around to David Bowie's uh, management. And uh, Bowie was in the in the room and everything, and all his um, entourage. Mm. And it was the first time I'd really come up close against people with makeup and really sort of weird design clothes. And uh, it was quite an experience. And uh, yeah, it was one of the, one of the, one of the memories of having the, met Bowie in that way. And of course, eventually, because we managed him, I was lucky enough to see the last uh, Ziggy Stardust show at uh, the Hammersmith Odeon. So um, great, good. It was, it was a good time. Good time. And, and you worked with uh, Lawrence Myers. Yeah, Lawrence Myers was managing, um, co-managing those acts. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And uh, and Bell Records, which well, which Bell, is kind of associated with the. Yes, yeah, Bell Records was uh, related to Lawrence, and as much that uh, Gary Glitter was. Yeah. On, on the label. Um, I think Lawrence was one of the first um, managers to put do what they call leasing of tapes of masters. Um, back in those days, artists were signed and, you know, uh, that, that was the way it was done. But Lawrence actually put a production company together and he paid for the recording and then subsequently licensed them. <coughs> so, um, yes, that's how Gary Glitter was done through, through Bell Records and Dick Lee here, of course, who yeah. I eventually went on to work for uh, at GTO Records when that was formed. Right. So. Right. So, so the, roughly when was that in terms of the time period? 70s, yeah. middle to late 70s, yeah. Yeah. Um, and then you moved on to Gem Records. Gem Records was formed, after GTO Records was formed and had many hits, and I worked with the Walker Brothers and Billy Ocean and Heatwave and all those sort of artists, I did regional yeah. promotion. They were it was sold to CBS, and I moved to work with CBS in their promotion department. Right. and worked with a number of their big acts, ABBA and Bruce Springsteen, and did promotion and stuff for those sort of people. And then in the meantime, Lawrence Myers decided to form another record company, which was one of the first independent labels that was sort of financed by a major record company, RCA. Yeah. And <clears throat> he asked me to come over and start the publishing, do a bit of A&R. And from Gem, we signed the UK subs and the VIPs, and we had a number one hit with Patrick and Hernandez. But it was um, a bit of a doomed venture, really. Um, yeah. And that, that closed. And when that closed, that's when I basically decided to start my own indie label because that was the thing that was happening. Lots of people were starting it. The, the market was there. There was singles were selling in, in big quantities. Um, yes. And that's, and that's how I st when I started Abstract. Hmm. So. Um, just just um, reversing there, just just a little bit. You, you mean. You, you're dealing with, or had had dealt with, some of the biggest names in the music industry. Talking about people like ABBA yes. and all that that must entail, um, and then you're going from that to ultimately through via Gem, you're going to set up. Well, after Gem, you're going to set up your own your own label. I mean, it must be, you know, very much two sides. Well, you come down with a the thump. That's the first thing, because yeah. obviously the first thing you have to realise is you're financing everything. Yeah, and uh, <clears throat> every you know. 
every every hundred pounds is a lot of money when you're trying to put a put a record together and you'll have expectations that it's going to do this and do that and you hear what other people are doing oh i should be able to do this and do that yeah um, and the first record I put out was a FK9 from, from Edinburgh, and I think we sold 200 copies, and I lost about 1,500 quid. So uh, right. straight away... Was that your savings, basically? Basically, or? my savings, um, uh, redundancy money and bits and pieces. And uh, yeah. so you, you immediately... That's the very first thing you, 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 uh, you, you come across, is that you're obviously not living in this world. I mean, the expense counts and all the rest of it. You're doing it on yeah. your own, and uh, what you do is what it's going to be. If it doesn't work, then... Uh, you're in trouble. You're in trouble. And do you think it only sold 200 copies because the record wasn't good enough or because it didn't have the promotion or the other things that you hadn't learned to do at that point? Well, I think it's a combination of both. It, it was an interesting record. It was a bit weird, the record, so I don't really think I was expecting to do thousands. Uh, also, it was a learning curve on how, you know, who you have to approach because suddenly I was having to talk to people at NME and Sounds yeah. and Melody Maker, which I'd never, ever done before. And I was having to sort of even try and get hold of John Peel. Although I'd done promotion at, in the bigger companies, John Peel was never in our sort of orbit. Uh, or, yes. orbit. It was always the major sense. So it was a, 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 you know, a total sort of re-education of what was going on. It was actually quite terrifying. Yeah. And I remember, you know, especially with later artists that John Peel started to play and gave me a lot of support, sort of, you know, my wife said, well, you know, why have you got the radio on at midnight, <laughs> you know, in the bedroom? Yeah. I said, I'm listening, John Peel's going to play John, Three Johns tonight. And, you know, you'd be in there listening to this and... Uh, you know, which I'd never, you know, with the major company, I wasn't really that bothered because you know, Abba, Abba was going to get played, yeah. soon, you know. But with your own record, every little thing counts, you know, and your, your excitement, getting a review, even getting a news release, mm -hmm. the record's out on your label, you know, the excitement was It was there. all personal, isn't it? It was personal, yeah. absolutely personal. You yeah. know, and times you got really angry when people slagged off the record and the label and then people didn't realise it was just you on your own. Yeah. And so you took it, you did take it personal, you didn't spouted out you felt a bit personal about it yeah i understand and those early you know the the early people on the label i mean when you when you sign those bands were they just was it more that you you like their records or you like them as artists did, did you have a a kind of um an overview of what well, you were doing i think um when you do things yourself there are some a and r people and some labels uh, that have They've just loved the music and had a whole style of what they were going to do and they had a whole way of they were going to do it and they've been successful I, I, things like Mute and Beggar's Banquet and things. I, they've gone on to be huge successful labels. <clears throat> My musical interest was quite varied. I didn't have any abstract, put all sorts of types of things out, sort of heavy rock and indie rock and yeah. dancey stuff and whatever. That may have been a good or bad thing, I don't know. I mean, I'm still around 20-odd years later, so it, it was successful on certain levels. But there's no question that when you sign something, you are looking at the potential sales. Yeah. You're, you're looking at not only musically, you're also looking at financially. It wasn't a hobby, a luxury. I could put out a thing I loved and it flopped. Mm. Uh, I needed it to sell records. I needed it to get promotion. I needed it to be at a certain level of success so that I could do the next one or even do their next single or album, whatever it was. So yeah. you, you take a, you take a, um, a measured judgment. Um, Yes, I think when you're very successful, you can, you can flirt with something you fancy doing because you fancy the music, but at that level, every, every record counted. You know. And I suppose, I mean, we, we talked about Three Johns, but they, they were a very hard gigging band yeah. as well. You know, they, they turned up on every venue yeah. that, of a show I went to yeah. for, for quite some time. Well, the Three Johns were, uh, 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 to be honest, one of my proudest moments yeah. uh, in the industry, I, apart from being three fantastic blokes. Um, I think they delivered fantastic records personally I thought their albums were great we had one or two fantastic singles and we, we had a little bit of bad luck actually because um, we had the uh, one of the singles was starting to get a lot of uh, airplay um, and um, I can't remember the thing I can't remember the title can we cut that <laughs> um, I can't remember I can't remember the title of uh, um, Death of a European yeah and it was getting hammered on Radio 1 and we were just starting to get some daytime, and of course then they had the Heisel Stadium disaster. You yeah. two had their Unforgettable Fire single out, and those both got stopped, yeah. dropped. But I noticed a couple of weeks you two got played, and ours didn't get real, and, the, and that was really getting hammered, and it was one of the best. But they were a brilliant band, and I think they wrote some really, really good stuff, and, I, and, and they were commercial. I think they should have, we, we should have been able to cross that over.